It's great to have everybody here. Thank you so much for, for coming out for this very special event. This is really our first formal uh, invitation guest, so brother, it's great to have you here. Let's all start with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for having the privilege to being your children. And God, we come to here tonight to, to allow you to have your word look into our lives to make us the complete person that you want us to be. Lord, help us as we tend to want to get un unbalanced in different parts of our life and different things. And we thank you for the message that you brought us tonight, that you would complete us in you, make us in the full image of, of your son, Jesus Christ. So be with us today. We ask you to please inspire, inspire uh, Brother Dennis Hollinger, and I pray that you would give us grace that all, all things done tonight be to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. So today we have with us a very special guest. We have Dr. Dennis P. Hollinger. He's our neighbor right up the road and president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, a position he's been there since 2008. So it's, it's very nice to meet you. It's great um, uh, having you here. I want to tell you a little bit about his, what he's been uh, standing for and his message that he has. Dr. Hollinger has worked in particular and, and faced many hard ethical issues. I, and looking at some of the things he stood for, I've appreciated you, you've, you've hit some of the hard issues of, of the defining marriage in our day, dealing with different issues of modern sexuality and, and taking those things to a biblical stance, but yet with a compassion. And I've really appreciated your, 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 uh, your writings and what you've attempted to, what you've done in that, that field. Um, he's been an interesting a lot of places where many of us come from. Um, he, he has had appointments at the Evangelical Seminary in Myerstown. That's right up 501. Many of you are from that area. Um, been in Messiah College and, and uh, also been associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana. And the Alliance Theological Seminary. But why do we have Dr. Hollinger coming here today? What do you think the message that Christ has for us? And I think it's a good one. We've created this, this whole forum called Sattler Talks for a particular purpose. Our desire is to take leaders, world leaders, who are making a difference in their generation, that are making a difference in the world, and either actions that they're doing and thoughts that, make, that we believe that can have answers for this generation. And so we believe that we're bringing these people in for this message that we need to hear. So what is the important message today uh, that we believe we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Hollinger? He's coming to us with a message named after his book, um, Head, Heart, and Hands, Bringing Together Christian Thought, Passion, and Action. Dr. Hollinger mentions in, in the book that as Christians, we strive to love the Lord with our heart, our soul, our mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And these greatest commandments, these two great commandments, God asks for the devotion of our heart, our head, and our hands. But in the church, we tend to, and in our own personal life, we tend to kind of get stuck into a certain niche. You know, like we are focusing in intellectually, and so we have... Uh, we are either an individual or a group or even entire movements he brings out in his book, entire movements that are just intellectual. There's other movements that are focusing more on the heart, you know, your revival groups, your, your more charismatic groups that they focus on that. And there's others that have done, he mentions whole groups like um, have social gospel and, and done things to help the poor and their emphasis on those kind of things. And we tend to get into one of those little niches and stay there. But I believe in it, it, the message that he has for us today is that Christ has designed for us to be holistic, to have all of these different elements in our life. And, and, and I think this is important for us. So here we are at the very beginning of our college, um, at the very beginning of trying, we've been bringing together, I think, some of the most impressive leaders of, of, of different professors from top-rate um, universities, and there could be a tendency for us to just go down an academic route. 
Uh, many of us come from a faith tradition that would be either more of a revivalistic or more of a uh, hands, uh, more of an action. And so now can we have an overreaction just into the mind, into academia, and these kind of things. And so he's encouraging us in this mission. He's exhorting us in, this, in his book to bring these things together. And the guiding verse, brother, of our school is taken from Timothy 1.7, that for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Mm. And so let's welcome Dr. Hollinger now, if you would. And he's going to hopefully exhort us um, to bring these elements together and have Christ create in us a holistic people, a holistic churches, and a holistic institution that will glorify him completely. Let's welcome Dr. Hollinger. Well, thank you so much. And it is a great joy to be here at Sattler and a real honor to uh, do this first lecture for you. Your president just gave, really, uh, the good summary of my lecture in three minutes, which, which will take me 60 minutes to get through. Uh, I have followed with interest the development of this college and what you are attempting to do here, and uh, we're grateful to God for you. Boston's a great city, not just because it wins football championships and World Series in baseball, uh, but, of course, a city with a great history. Uh, a city which over the uh, years, in many ways, has lost its historic rootage, uh, a great heritage. And in the secularization process, a lot of that has, of course, been forgotten. And many have reacted uh, quite negatively to that heritage. So whenever Christians are here in the midst of Boston, it's always a wonderful welcome thing. Uh, one of the great things that we've had the privilege of seeing at Gordon Conwell over the years is so many of our students go into churches, uh, often in the small towns of New England, where churches had become uh, more than just liberal. Some of them had become very secular. Uh, some of them were down to 14, 15 people coming to church on a Sunday. Uh, the Bible was hardly used. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had many of our students who've gone into these churches, seen revitalization, and uh, a great work of God's Spirit, which is a wonderful thing to see. So uh, we welcome you to Boston you. as we work together for the sake of God's kingdom. I have entitled my talk tonight, Head, Heart, and Hands, A Theological Paradigm for Christian Education. And I do hope that this will be a helpful framework as you think as students, as faculty members, as administrators, as friends of the school, a helpful paradigm to guide as you think about what education should be and what it should seek to accomplish. I'm going to be working with a typological construct, and whenever you take courses in the social sciences, you are usually introduced to the notion of typologies. The concept of a typology goes back um, Whoops, we somehow went blank there. Okay. All right. Hopefully it'll stay up. Technology is wonderful as long as it works. Uh, Ernst Trouch, uh, early 20th century, and Max Weber, sociologist, probably best known for his work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. They were the two individuals that really developed the notion of typologies as a way of trying to construct understanding of a broad cluster of ideas and movements. And so what they attempted to do was to show that there are types of expression, whether it be ideas, movements in history, and uh, no one group, no one idea fits perfectly into a given type but it's a way of doing comparative analysis. It's a way of helping to understand the complexities of reality in the world around us. And there have actually been a number of typologies that have been developed throughout Christian history, and I'll just mention these briefly before I get to the one that I'm going to work with this evening. In relationship of Christian faith and culture, there was developed very early on by Ernst Trelch the notion of church types of churches and sect types of churches. It was a way of trying to understand how religious groups, Christian religious groups, related to the society. 
And as Trelch, this is a two volume set he wrote, about 500 pages each volume, called The Social Teachings of the Christian Church. And Trelch said uh, a church type of expression is one that is fully at home in the culture and society. They live in the middle of society, and sometimes you can't tell much difference between the church and the culture around it. The sect type lives at odds with the society. It's often on the fringes of society, and it defines itself many times over against society. Some years later, about a half century later, H. Richard Niebuhr, who taught down at Yale University, came along and wrote what has become a classic work in Christian uh, academia. It was a book called Christ and Culture. He expanded this notion into five types, Christ against culture, Christ of culture, in which essentially they blend together, Christ above culture, seen particularly in the Roman Catholic tradition, Christ and culture in paradox, and Christ the transformer of culture. Now those were five different ways of thinking about the intersection of Christian faith and the culture or society. You have also uh, typologies developed with church polity. Church polity refers to how churches govern themselves. And basically, we have understood historically that there have been three major types of church governance. Episcopal forms of governance, in which the power is basically at the top with bishops or archbishops in the Roman Catholic tradition with a pope. And then you have Presbyterian polity, and this is much broader than just that denomination, but it is the idea in which you have more of a representative form of government in every church, decisions are made, uh, yes, some decisions by the congregation, but mostly by elders who have been chosen uh, by the body to make those decisions and always an accountability system outside it. And then you have congregational forms of church government in which the decision making and the power rests with the congregation. I might add a footnote on this because I've always been fascinated with it. Um, actually, two footnotes that I'll make. One is that these three forms of church polity actually correspond to three forms of civil government, Episcopal and monarchy, Presbyterian and a more republic form of government, parliamentary form of government, and congregational very much corresponding to democracy. Uh, and some would even say frontier democracy. One of the things that's very interesting about the congregational polity, and those of you who come from Anabaptist traditions, as I think many of you, most of you do, uh, was very much a congregational polity, some exceptions along the lines. It's a very complex history, as I understand it. But uh, it's interesting that uh, in congregational polity, you've also had uh, a development of powerful leaders, uh, because there's no mechanism actually to put controls on an individual leader with a d great deal of charisma. So if you look at some megachurches in the United States today, many of them have emerged in a kind of congregational polity in which there's really no system of accountability outside. That's one of the interesting challenges uh, about a congregational polity. Or there have been typologies developed in relationship to theology. Probably the one that is best known is conservative theology, which adheres to uh, often to the creeds of the Christian church, to the authority of scripture, to the main doctrines of the Christian faith, such as the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and then liberal theology, or often today, uh, liberal theology goes under the name progressive theology, in which there's an attempt to try to accommodate Christian thought to the larger impulses of the world around them. Now, I'm going to work with a different typological construct tonight, which I've written about in my book, Head, Heart, and Hands, which Dean mentioned. And it is a typology that focuses on the essence of the Christian life. What fascinated me in this is I looked through the history of the church, and I realized that Christians have very different ways of understanding the heart of their Christian faith. Some have understood it primarily through the lens of the head. That is, the mind is the key. Others have understood it primarily through the heart. That is, through affections, passions, emotions. That's the central core of a person. That's the central core of Christian faith and the way that faith is expressed. And then others 
uh, a faith of the hands in which it's action, either action of proclamation of the gospel on the one hand or actions of social justice, mercy, and service on the other hand. Now, what has uh, struck me uh, as I've looked at the history of the Christian church, and my field, my primary field is ethics, but uh, when you do Christian ethics, you've got to do a lot of church history in the, in the combination of it. And I did some sociology of religion as well in, in my background and in my doctoral work. What struck me was how often groups, denominations, traditions, and individuals tend to be lodged in primarily one of these three. So I'd like to do is kind of go through these three with you, some uh, historic examples, how each of them thinks about Christian faith. And in the end, I'm going to try to put the three together for us and contend that what we need both in the Christian life in education is an interaction between those three types rather than isolating them. So let me start with the faith of the head. Here, faith is primarily about beliefs and understandings. So if you ask a person who has a faith of the head, how do you understand your Christian faith? They probably will say, uh, well, I believe in X, Y, and Z. Their first response will be what they believe in. For these Christians, when they think about Christian maturity, it will probably go something like this. A mature Christian is one who really understands and knows the Bible and knows the doctrines of the Christian faith and adheres to them. Often it is the concept that if we get our thinking straight, everything else in life will fall into place. I will be a good spouse in a marriage. I will be a good citizen in my neighborhood. I uh, will have my life together emotionally, and I will live as a disciple of Jesus Christ because I think correctly about my Christian faith. The assumption here is that the ratio, it's the Latin term for reason, that the reason, the rational aspect, is the center of human personality. So that if you really want to get to know a person and what makes them tick, you try to analyze how they think, what's in their brain. Here, uh, the famous uh, phrase from the French philosopher Descartes would probably be the right dictum. He used this in a bit of a different context, but I think, therefore, I am. Thinking is the essence of a human person. Right thought is the essence of Christian faith. And of course, uh, one at first glance can find many passages of Scripture that would seem to give credence to this. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing of your minds. Now, one of the things that's forgotten is that the word mind, as it is used in the New Testament, uh, is actually used in different ways, and it doesn't always just mean the rational component of a human person. But at least as we read it initially, we think of the cognitive capabilities. Or we think of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And the word for answer there is apologia, from which we get the word apologetic. And so the faith of the head is primarily an expression of Christian faith that concentrates on belief and concentrates on the cognitive aspect. What's a good worship service for these folks? You go to church and you've had your thinking somehow challenged. You've gained a deeper understanding of God's word. And that becomes the mark of a good church and good worship. Now, a number of examples throughout history of the faith of the head. In the Middle Ages, there was a movement called medieval scholasticism. Uh, the medieval scholastics are sometimes characterized by a debate, we don't know whether it really happened or not, in which they debated how many angels could dance on the head of a needle. I'm not sure at all what the theological significance of that was, or if there was any at all, or if the whole thing is just kind of a myth. But uh, the scholastics gave detailed attention to rational thought and in the Christian faith. They believed that the mind was really the most important element of their faith. 
and they gave great deal of attention to Christian doctrine, trying to probe it, put it together in the Middle Ages. Interestingly, you had a similar movement after the Protestant Reformation called Protestant scholasticism. It was particularly found in what we call the Reformed traditions of the Christian faith, or in the Lutheran forms, Lutheran traditions of, uh, of Protestant Christianity. Uh, but it was uh, very much like the, uh, the medieval scholasticism, which of course was Roman Catholic, in that uh, the thinking, the theological astuteness was the most important element. Ironically, you also find it on the very liberal side of Christian expression in the late 19th century, what is sometimes called modernism, in which they believed that Christianity was going to have to adapt to modern thought, modern scientific understandings, uh, modern sci uh, social scientific understandings, and so uh, rationality became a key in that more liberal expression. Obviously, you can see here very different expressions uh, in actually the theology between a medieval scholasticism of Protestant and liberalism. Encountering that liberalism, there developed in the early part of the 20th century a movement called fundamentalism, which was a very separatistic movement, uh, but a movement that gave a great deal of attention to theological orthodoxy, preserving that as the key to a dynamic church. So that uh, if you ask the question, how do you develop a dynamic church, a church is going to be faithful to Christ, the answer was always, you maintain right theology. That's the faith of the head. Second, faith of the heart. This is a very different expression. And if you get, the, uh, if you get faith of the head types and faith of the heart types together and sit down, they often just kind of miss each other. They're like ships passing in the night in some ways. Why? Well, because their faith is a faith of feelings, passion, affections, deep inward spiritual experiences. And often the emphasis is on the immediate and inner experience with God. So that God is not thought of in these rational categories, but God is intuited inwardly. And uh, the test of maturity is, do you feel and sense the presence of God? Uh, the, uh, the criteria for a good worship service is to use the language of uh, John Wesley, my heart strangely warmed by God and warmed by the Spirit of God. In, in this approach, the view is that affection and the... Uh, um, Affection and emotion are really the key to the human person. So what is it that will truly make you a disciple of Christ? What is it that will truly enable you to be used by God amidst the complexities of the world? It is a right heart, right affections, right inward self. And of course, in, in the scriptures, we have various terms that are utilized with regard to the more inner part of the human self, words like heart, spirit, soul. And by the way, those are actually used interchangeably at some point. I think I saw that you all are going to require Greek. Is that right? Greek and Hebrew. Greek and Hebrew. Good for you. Well, when you get into Greek, you'll see this, that words aren't always used the same uh, in every place, and you have to determine the context, how Paul might be using it here, but he may be using the same term in a little different way. But one of the, the things that we find is that these terms are often used interchangeably. Even the mind, the word mind, sometimes has more of an inner con connotation, and the context helps you determine that. So the affections, the emotions are the key to the person. You want to know who a person is? You sit down with them and you get a hold of what they feel. You get a hold of what they sense deep down within the fiber of their soul. Here, Descartes' dictum would change, and instead of I think, therefore I am, it would be I feel, therefore I am. And once again, we can find numerous biblical passages that probably fit with this approach. I think of Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. 
In him my heart trusts, so I am helped and my heart exalts. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20, I will give one heart and put a new spirit with them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. The idea here in Ezekiel is that when there is a renewed heart, then they will be enabled to keep the law of God, the law of Yahweh. Or Luke 24, 32 on the Emmaus Road after the resurrection. The disciples said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scripture to us? Uh, Jesus met up with several of the disciples on the road to Emmaus following the resurrection, and they did not recognize him at first in the resurrected body. Uh, And he began to teach them and their hearts were moved and warmed And then they recognized him. So the faith of the heart component is going to strongly emphasize those kinds of verses. Now, we have a lot of historic examples. Let me just mention several of these. One is mysticism. I mentioned that you had a scholasticism during the Middle Ages, which was highly head-oriented. But you also had a mystical movement that began to develop in the Middle Ages. Interestingly, it often developed in times of great trauma, such as the plague, when the plague swept through Europe. Uh, There was corresponding to that a kind of flourishing of mystical movements. Mystical movements were very inner-oriented, and uh, here is a quote from one, uh, a well-known Spanish mystic, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, and she writes this, One sees nothing, either within or without, but while seeing nothing, the soul understands quite clearly who it is and where it is, and sometimes even what he means to tell it. How and by what means it understands, it does not know. Isn't that an interesting phrase? How one understands, it does not know. It simply knows they've experienced the presence of God in this very powerful inward way. Another movement a bit later on was pietism, 17th, 18th century. It developed in reaction to the Protestant scholasticism I mentioned a few moments ago, Uh, and it was really reacting to a kind of cold, dead orthodoxy, where people had all their theology straight, but there was no life and vitality. And the pietistic movement came along It began meeting primarily in homes initially. They actually called them classes. And as they met together, they would share what God was doing in their hearts. And by the way, it was out of the pietist movement that John Wesley came and the whole Wesleyan movement uh, because uh, he was strongly influenced by pietists after having grown up very much with the faith of the head in the Anglican tradition. And then probably the best known example today would be the Pentecostal charismatic movements. And you notice I put that in the plural uh, because there are many charismatic Pentecostal movements around the world today and they vary a lot. But this is the fastest growing element of Christianity in the world today, uh, far and away. Nothing, uh, no other movement uh, in uh, Protestant Christianity that corresponds to it. And it's made its mark, by the way, even in the Roman Catholic Church as well, and and, uh, in some places you might not expect. Here the emphasis, and and this movement began early 20th century. There was a revival uh, called the Azusa Revival out in uh, near Los Angeles that emerged in 1917. And that was kind of the beginning of this wave of Pentecostal charismatic expression. Strong emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit, such as speaking in tongues as a mark of God's hand upon an individual and being filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, There was a strong emphasis on spontaneity, so that the best sermon was not a prepared sermon. As a matter of fact, um, I've talked to folks who grew up in the Assembly of God Church, and they can remember this from the earliest days. This would be going back to more my father's generation, who's no longer living, but uh, back in the 1920s and so forth. Uh, Oftentimes, you would have three or four preachers, and they would be sitting up front, and they didn't know who was going to preach. 
uh, it was the Spirit of God that tapped on the shoulder of one of them, and they got up and they preached. No preparation. You can see how different this is from the faith of the head where you exegete the text and you make sure you've got that text down perfectly. Here it's the spontaneous leading of the Spirit of God. And the more spontaneous was, the more evidence it was of vital Christianity. So this, uh, these are some examples of the faith of the heart movement. And uh, it's interesting to me, as I, I've given the, this kind of lecture in varying forms in different parts of the world, and uh, I, I've always been fascinated. There are certain parts of the world I go to where this is very clearly. I will sometimes ask people, especially if it's in an academic setting, wh where do you fall on the head, the heart, and the hands? And uh, for example, when I've been in Korea, uh, it's 95% uh, heart, <laughs> heart-oriented. We come now to the third, the faith of the hands. Faith of the hands. Here, faith is a matter of acting and doing. If faith doesn't demonstrate itself, these folks argue, then it's not genuine live faith. The test of whether a person is truly a believer is what they do. Not what they think, not what they feel, what they do. Action itself is the catalyst for growth. How do you grow spiritually? By getting out and doing it, putting it into practice in your life. That's the heart and the essence of true Christian faith. And the argument here would be that we are homo faber, to use the Latin term. Uh, that is the essence of our human nature, the human person as maker and doer. We are doers by God's design. And if we're not doing, we're not fulfilling the designs of God in our life, it goes. Here, uh, Descartes' dictum would now change to, I act, therefore I am, or I do, therefore I am. Because it is my acting and my doing which is at really the heart of who I am as a human person. And of course, uh, we can think of a number of biblical passages that would fit into this. And I've listed several of them. Let me just read those texts very quickly for you. Um, Ephesians 2.10, which comes, of course, after Ephesians 2.8 and 9, which reminds us we are not saved by our works, but by the grace of God. But then comes this interesting verse. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Or we think of James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Mm -hmm. Or... Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Historic expressions of this. Um, certainly uh, one, uh, and, and we actually need to divide this into two groups. Uh, some we would call perhaps ministries of proclamation, where when they think about action in the world, it is primarily mission and evangelism, and mission as proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so here I have a picture of William Carey, sometimes referred to as uh, one of the first uh, of modern mission movement in the 19th century. D.L. Moody, great evangelist of the latter part of the 19th century. And when you look at these movements and evangelists, uh, it was very clear that the most important thing you could do as a Christian was share the good news of Jesus Christ. That was above all else. Often, there was a kind of downplaying in these movements, not all, but there was often a downplaying on education, the kind of education you're getting here, because the Lord was coming back any day, and we need to get out there now and do it, uh, and uh, don't waste your time in all that education. That was often one of the emphases uh, in these movements. On the other hand, there were what we call ministries of presence. That is, more ministries of action by what we are doing in the world. 
And so here I would think of Francis of Assisi from the Middle Ages, who has this uh, great phrase that has often been quoted, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Or, and you all can debate this one, uh, Anabaptists are sometimes put into this category. And, uh, and, and today, I think there's enough uh, kind of uh, diversity among Anabaptists that you, you probably could find representatives in all three camps. Uh, but obviously, the emphasis that discipleship is a, a life of service, uh, a life of peace in the midst of a, a turbulent and violent world. The social gospel movement of the latter 19th century was a strong emphasis on the kingdom of God being extended into the structures of society. And uh, the social gospelers really believed that the country, uh, it was a very American movement, there were some uh, semblances of it in Great Britain and Canada, but here in the United States uh, there was actually a, a kind of belief that we were becoming more and more a Christian nation. Uh, because we were a democracy, and if we could just yet touch the economic forces of society, then the kingdom of God would become a reality in the world. It was often described as a kind of Christian socialism, by the way. They weren't too fond of market economics. And then, more recently, uh, a somewhat similar but different movement, different context, liberation theology, which first emerged in Latin America in the early 1970s, has spread to various parts of the world. And uh, the liberation theology takes its primarily starting point from the Exodus in the Old Testament and the argument that God's main work in the world is liberating people from injustices and particularly from oppressive structures within culture and society. Other expressions I could give of this, and obviously liberation theology has a lot of variations all over the world, but this least gives you a little bit of a semblance of this approach. Now, what I've said is that historically, most Christians, many denominations have fallen into one of these two uh, typologies as a primary emphasis. My basic thesis is we need a holistic faith in which all three are present, and this is really key, each nurtures the other. I don't think you get your theology straight by thinking alone. Your heart, the condition of your heart, has a lot to do with how you'll put your understanding of your faith together. And your actions often precondition you to accept certain things. I've often been fascinated with this. I, 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 I've been fascinated because I, I've seen it up close when people begin to drift away from a classical, historic, orthodox Christianity. That is small o, adherence to the major doctrines of the faith. And one of the things I've often noticed is there are changes of lifestyle, there are changes of patterns that often go on that actually end up influence the thinking. Right. And so I don't think it's merely a matter of thought that we get our theology straight. And of course, none of us get it perfectly straight. We all see through a glass darkly, right. but there are certain things that are just so core to the Christian faith, you pull them out and you no longer have Christian faith, right? You have something else. And so... Uh, the same is true of our, of our inward spiritual life. If you only have an emphasis on the heart, you can end up with all kinds of crazy notions of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And today, the world is filled with lots of spiritualities that have very little to do with Jesus Christ, Christ at the center of that. And even in Christian expressions, you sometimes have ended up with some very heretical notions because the focus was so much on what made me feel good, what made me feel right. And it began to kind of lead in some very deviant patterns. And so obviously our theology needs to intersect with our spirituality. And I think as well our heart is impacted by the things we do, by our actions. And the same when you come to action, it's influenced by the mind, it's influenced by the heart, and all three of them are intertwined together. So they really nurture each other, I think. And, and um, that's why at Gordon Conwell, we have put an increasing emphasis uh, uh, over the years, and especially in my last 11 years there, 
that uh, people going into the ministry, whether it be pastor, admissions, counseling, parachurch work, whatever, uh, that we have to have a strong spiritual formation along with the biblical theological formation. And they need to have minister, mentored ministry in which they are out doing it. So it's the, it's the mix of doing and thinking, and you need to think well. I mean, we don't water things down at Gordon-Conwell, and I don't think we should. Mm -hmm. Loving God with our main minds mean we think hard. Mm -hmm. We use those minds well. I think that's very, very important. But a recognition that that spiritual inner dimension and the action dimensions of our life must be there, and they are all intertwined to produce the kind of people that God wants us to be. And when we don't have them, we really end up with dis, uh, neglect and sometimes overemphasis or neglect on the other side. Now, why do I argue this way? Let me just give you some foundations for holding head, heart, and hands together. First of all, I think it comes out of a holistic theological anthropology. Theological anthropology very simply refers to our Christian understanding of the human person. And one of the things that I think uh, more and more evangelical Christians and Orthodox Christians, and again, I'm using that term with people who adhere to scripture and salvation by faith as, a, as that term, Orthodox. Um, one of the things that I think is increasing is an understanding that we were created by God as whole beings. Sometimes I do a lot of work in bioethics, and, and sometimes we talk about in the, in the field of bioethics as Christians that we are embodied souls or we are in souled bodies. So you never can separate those two. And the idea here is that our physical self, our internal self, and the cognitive dimensions of the self are all intertwined together. And I don't have time to develop this tonight, but you can make a really good case for that scripturally in a lot of different ways, precisely because of the different ways, and I referred to this earlier, the different ways that terms are used in overlapping fashion. Mind, heart, soul, spirit. They're not used just as, this is one part of yourself, over here is your spirit, over here is your soul. Uh, that used to be the debate, were you a trichotomist believing soul, spirit, and body, or were you a dichotomist in which spirit and soul? More and more now, I think biblical scholars who take scripture seriously are emphasizing we really are whole beings. And so a holistic theological anthropology from the get-go says all three of these are really important to who you are as a human person. And so in your education here at Sattler, it's not simply enough to deal with your thinking. It's not simply enough to understand the objective world that is out there or to even to understand yourself. There are dimensions, other dimensions of ourselves that need to be nurtured and to be developed. And then there were, of course, lots of biblical support. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not going to go into these, but here's just a whole list of texts if you want to jot any of these down. And none of them use actual head, heart, hands language, although some of them come very close to it. It's very interesting. But when you look at the text, what you see in almost all of these is an interplay of these three dimensions, that they are all three at work. Uh, the Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9, we often call that the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And it goes on to talk about how the commands of God are to be part of your daily life. They are to be embedded in your mind. They are to be embedded in your heart. And then you're to practice them throughout the day. That's the gist and essence of the great Shema text of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And so that's a, a classic example in the Old Testament of uh, a head, heart, and hands kind of faith. And then I would suggest another avenue of support for this approach is natural theology. And what I mean by natural theology, in, in theology we often talk about two dimensions, a general revelation, which is a revelation that comes through history and observation of the world and through human experience, and special revelation, which is the very specific revelation that comes through Holy Scripture and through Christ. And general revelation, though, no, does tell us some things about God, about the world, etc. Uh, sometimes uh, we actually refer to this as an, an element of common grace. 
that God does pour out certain gifts and certain understandings to people who don't even acknowledge Him. So, are there atheists who discover certain objective realities about the world in the sciences? Of course. Are there uh, atheist psychiatrists who have actually contributed to our understanding of human behavior and the human psyche? Yes. Not because they knew Christ, but because God has given a kind of common grace that all people can know and perceive. Jesus spoke of this on the Sermon on the Mount when he said he sends his son on the just and the unjust, that he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay? So God doesn't discriminate when he sends the sun out to make the crops grow or when he sends the rain to make the crops grow. Uh, God pours it out on all humanity. That's common grace, and there are understandings about life and reality that, in which we get an insight about the role of the head, heart, and hands. Let me just mention a couple of these very quickly. One is the field of social psychology. Uh, social psychology is a very interesting dimension because it studies the human person, but it studies the human person in a social context. And it understands how the human person is developing in relationship to the culture and societal patterns around them. And I want to give you a quote. It comes from David Myers, who is a professor at uh, Hope College in Michigan, a Christian college. This is a widely used textbook in social psychology. He writes this. If social psychology has told us anything during the last 25 years... It is that we are likely not only to think ourselves into a way of acting, but also to act ourselves into a way of thinking. It's a very fascinating phrase. Not only do we think ourselves into a way of acting, we do. But what social psychology, he's saying, has understood as well is we act ourselves into a way of thinking. And he goes on to give some just really fascinating examples. Sometimes people who have played roles in movies, for example. Um, and and he, um, he, he uses just a number of examples of different films that have been developed where people actually playing the role found that it had an impact on their thinking and on their inner self, playing out that role by action. It's very, very fascinating. Or we could turn to philosophy. Uh, and a major name here would be Michael Polanyi, uh, an early uh, 20th century scientist and philosopher who challenged the notion of scientific, pure scientific objectivism, that you could always know reality fully, objectively, through a scientific method alone. Now, he wasn't downgrading the scientific method. What he was doing was challenging the notion of a pure scientific objectivism. And he goes on to describe the fact that our sentiments, our kind of larger worldview assumptions, our commitments in life often predispose us to how we view even scientific analysis. This work was picked up, by the way, uh, very much by Thomas Kuhn in his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He picked it up very much on Polanyi's work to try to show that when major revolutions occurred in the sciences, they did not occur primarily through the scientific method. They occurred through imagination, which were then tested out by the scientific method. Uh, they were developed because people began to look at the data, ah, that just looks differently. It wasn't a pure objective, it was a way in which one's particular approach to life an approach to reality around you began to influence actually what you were going to look at in the scientific method. It's very, very fascinating. Or we could think here of educational theory. Uh, Pestalozzi was an 18th century Swiss, Swiss educator, had a major, major impact upon modern education. And he actually used the language of head, heart, and hands. And he said that true education is an education in which, yes, you feed the mind, but you also give attention to the inner self, and he called it the heart, and also you learn by acting and by doing. And by the way, and I don't know what you all are planning here at Sattler on this, but a lot of Christian colleges over the last number of years have begun to say, you know, our students got to get out of the labs. 
They've got to get out of the classroom and out into the world, and there is a whole notion of service learning which has developed in which you are engaged and involved in your communities and in societies and in whether it be law and medicine, uh, in, in the corporate world, whatever, and you actually learn a great deal by being out there and doing. Uh, and, and all of that really goes back to uh, Pestalozzi in the 18th century. And then Howard Gardner, closer to home, educational psychologist over at Harvard, who developed the notion of multiple intelligences, in which he said we don't just learn one way, we don't develop intelligence one way. We actually develop intelligence, he said, in some intuitive ways which are much more inward in nature. It's very, very fascinating. He, uh, they, he and, and others who worked with him on this over the years developed eight different kinds of intelligence which are developed, which moves beyond just a pure, rational, cognitive approach. Well, what I want to suggest to you is it's precisely that that God wants for us in our lives and wants for us, I think, in the learning environments in which we are in. I think the impact of this model uh, is quite significant. It impacts, it impacts, obviously, individuals. It impacts the church. It's interesting, after I wrote this book, and uh, it came out in 2005, InterVarsity Press, uh, I, got, I started getting a number of calls from churches who said, um, you know, we kind of like to use this as a framework for thinking about our Christian education programs in the church. And so I've known a number of churches that have actually used the framework to look at their own curriculum and even to look uh, to some degree at their preaching to see are we developing a balanced kind of Christianity that gives attention to all three dimensions. So it can have a, a, a great impact, I think, upon the church. Upon education, and, and as I read your materials and your website, I think your commitments are very much aligned this direction already, and I really commend you for that. And I would suggest it can actually have an impact upon the culture, especially when Christians begin to develop holistic approach to faith. I actually think that the greatest apologetic for the 21st century is not a pure rational approach. If you look at most apologetics of the 20th century, it was how do you find the rational proofs for the existence of God, for the deity of Christ, for the resurrection of Christ, the authenticity of Holy Scripture, etc. We live in a very fragmented world where increasingly people don't reason in the way they did in the 20th century. For lack of a better term, we often call this the postmodern world or late modernity. But I really think that the greatest uh, demonstration of Christian faith doesn't come just by reason. Mm -hmm. It's important. Dare not put it aside. But I think it comes when people see a holistic Christianity which really touches every dimension of life. Amen. So that people see our actions. That's what happened in the first century. Christians went around and they picked up the babies that had been abandoned because nobody wanted them anymore. They looked out for the poor and the downtrodden. They looked for people who were often uh, put on the periphery of society because they didn't quite fit. And uh, in an amazing way, the gospel was proclaimed in a context in which it was lived. And in a context in which people really felt it. And it began to make a huge difference in the culture and the society. So, uh, my encouragement to you, keep developing your whole self for the glory of God. Develop the mind as students. Develop it well. It's so important. God wants to use it, whatever he calls you to. But develop that inner self, that personal, deep relationship with God. And develop your actions in the midst of a very complex and broken world that is searching for true reality. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, what a, what a perfect word that uh, we need right at the beginning of our school. You know, the, these very elements that you're trying to give to us is, is something that God has put on our heart. I mean, like for each of our majors, you know, we're trying to combine these things. It's, it's very tough and rigorous here in the academic world, and, and we're glad for that. The, 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 the level of professors that we're bringing here, we're very impressed with. Um, but also the inspiration that one of our, our um, 
our mission statements is we want to inspire the hearts to, to these things. And also in each of our, of our different majors, we're hoping to have an element, whether that's business, computer science, whether biblical religious studies, biology, that we want them to be able to go and experience that in a foreign field or in some ministry uh, opportunity some way here in this, country, uh, in this country also. And so we're really excited about bringing these together. And I, I'm very blessed that you, you've given us this exhortation today to, to get this right. It's, it's right, uh, perfect word for us. We're going to have Hans. Uh, where are you, Hans? Uh, yeah, he's going to lead the, uh, some questions and, and take it from here. So thank you, brother. Yes, yeah, so now it's uh, your opportunity to uh, pose some questions uh, after this uh, thought provoking yeah. uh, talk. So I'll, I'll bring the microphone to you if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, yeah, speaking uh, right into it. Then we can uh, capture your voice on the recording as well. A practical advice on, uh, you said that churches often tend to go in one uh, direction or the other, and it is one of the most, I found for, from personal experience that it is one of the most difficult things to try to change that or to, to try even to, to stop that. So uh, practically, how would you go about somehow stopping a whole body of people from moving in another direction yeah. in which maybe it would be too much on one side or too much on the other, and how would yeah. you practically uh, counter that? Well, I, I, a very, very good question. Um, let me respond first of all, and, and I think this is related, it's the most often, quest, uh, often posed question I've gotten from uh, th this framework, and, and that is why are we oriented in one of the three ways? And I think it's a combination of things. It's, it's a combination sometimes of our personalities, there's some personalities that are just much more head-oriented. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to confess, and I think part of the reason I ended up writing this book is I'm very head-oriented. Right. That's, that's, that's kind of my native uh, set. Uh, it, it's easier for me to think than to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I have trouble with the feeling aspect probably more than any others, okay? Um, uh, my wife has helped me with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although she's, she's pretty head-oriented herself. <laughs> um, so it's personality, sometimes it's culture. And uh, we have to be very careful with cultural stereotyping. We want to be very, very careful of that. But there's no question that some cultures are just more rationally oriented, and there's some cultures that are far more emotively oriented. And there's some cultures that are just real doers, go out and do it. And so there's cultural factors. And then thirdly are the traditions in a given church tradition. So those are the three factors, and if we realize that, then we have to, I think, become very self-aware. What are the things that have shaped and molded me the way I am? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that is often neglected today uh, in, in churches, in Christian faith, in Christian higher education is self-awareness. What's happening in me? Who am I? What drives me? Uh, why am I the way I am? That, that sense of self-awareness is, is very, very important. And, of course, there are numerous biblical passages that talk about really looking at ourselves, analyzing ourselves so that Christ can truly penetrate into us. So I think you start with self-awareness, Where what type do I fall into? And then I think uh, churches need to work at this in terms of really appealing in worship and in teaching and in preaching to all three of these dimensions. So the church has a responsibility, I think, in all of this. And then I think sometimes we just have to push ourselves. I've talked to people who say, you know, I just have to push myself to read. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good thing. Right. Or uh, I have to push myself to give attention to the aesthetic side of life, okay? So go down to Symphony Hall. <laughs> You know, uh, and, and, and there are experiences like that that are not our native, um, uh, that are not our native orientation. We put ourselves into them. It begins to open up, I think, a new dimension of the self. And so not all these have to be even spiritual exercises. If, if, you're, if you're not attuned to music, but one of the ways to get more attuned to that inner aesthetic aspect of self is simply to put yourself into those kinds of settings. Sometimes we have to really push ourselves to get out and to do, whether it's sharing our faith with a neighbor or friend, 
or becoming involved in a soup kitchen or being involved in some kind of a, uh, a, a movement for mercy and love and justice within the world, whatever those things are uh, that you feel called to, that we have to push ourselves knowing that that's not my native self. So I think that part of it is knowing oneself, then having the church really begin to work at this in a full-orbed way, educational institutions in a full-orbed way, but then opening ourselves to where we are weak and where we need to be further developed. It's really an interesting talk, and uh, I've been looking at this uh, parallelism of anything to do with Trinity, or even the traditional theology that is orthodoxy, orthopados, and uh, orthopraxis, it's all talking the same language. Just in terms of controlling part, even in health, when you look at the physical, mental, and social, like is there any th out of the three components that you are presenting here, is there any controlling part that, or is this equally contributing, yeah. or there is that something which confused many times? Very, very good question. And uh, I, I think uh, a lot of us probably assume, well, there's one part that just takes priority over others. As I've said, we're probably all gonna be oriented in one way, either by our culture or our personality. But it would seem to me that we don't get out of this box that we're in if we say, okay, I'm just gonna focus on this. This has priority. Um, I'm just not convinced that, uh, I'll take a, you know, let's just take liberation theology, which starts with orthopraxis. You mentioned that. Uh, liberation theology says you start theology with action and you work back to God. Right. Well, your action is going to influence your conceptions of God, but I think that can be very, very dangerous. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to the liberation theologian, don't make that the primary. Make it deeply involved in your solid theological thinking, which for me is going to start with scripture and start with Christ, okay? It's going to start with the Christian narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and final restoration. Those kind of frameworks need to be there. And so to the person who's very head-oriented and says, well, you know, if I just understand a little bit more, then I think I'll get this inner self right. I think I'll get my actions out in the world. I'm going to say, you know, you probably are not. You're probably just going to dig deeper into what you're secure in. And so I don't think there's really a starting point. I think because we are whole beings, the three just simultaneously need to be addressed and continually addressed in our lives. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. And, uh, I just sort of had a question. You had mentioned um, you had kind of walked through the different types of churches or types of denominations mm -hmm. for each of the, the three, mm -hmm. um, you know, mind, heart, hand. And you mentioned that the heart denominations are the ones that are growing, I think you said, by far. Mm -hmm. the, Pentecostal, the Pentecostal, yes. Charismatic. Yeah. And I'm just curious why that is. Yeah. Is it a cultural thing? Is it sort of something that people in this day and age are lacking and, and there's a gravitation toward that. Mm -hmm. well, how would you yeah. respond to that? Probably a number of factors. Um, I, I think uh, one is that where Christianity is really growing and it's heart oriented, it's tapping into something that's already very prevalent in the culture. And so that contextual aspect, as we sometimes call it, is really a good thing. People are hungry for God. They're, they're hungry to experience transcendent reality in their life. However, if you talk to any leader in Africa, fastest growing, this is the continent where Christianity is growing the fastest. Almost every leader, and I have a number of theologian friends who are from Africa and working in this, and they'll tell you, there's just one big problem. Christianity is about that deep. And the result is you got all kinds of heretical movements, all kinds of things that are developing. And people are often so controlled by the emotive aspect that they never get around to doing. And they are open and vulnerable to all kinds of thought that can lead them astray. One of the biggest menaces, by the way, uh, and this is not just in the continent of Africa, it's also in Asia and in Latin America, is what we call the health and wealth gospel. Yeah. 
in which the gospel gets boiled down to a, it's good news about how you can prosper and flourish and develop and become rich in life because God wants to bless us. And it greatly, greatly distorts Christian faith. And you can go, um, you could go into um, Nigeria and Kenya, and you go to churches with 10, 15,000 people, charismatic preacher, you don't hear very much word. You hear a lot of how you too can prosper and be rich and be what God wants you to be with his blessings upon you. So that's a dangerous side. Let me just pick on another example because I've been there many times and I, I you know, it, uh, it, and I should pick on American because American church is in bad shape. Uh, but let, let me just take one other country, um, Korea. I've been to Korea now at least five, six times. We've had a lot of students from Korea at Gordon Conwell. As you all know, Korea for a number of years was the fastest growing church in the world. Incredible missions movement, sending missionaries all over the world. Known particularly for the early morning prayer meetings. And people get up at 5 o'clock. I preached to 5,000 people at 5.30 in the morning at churches in Korea. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it looks wonderful. It's, a, it's a very much an expression of the heart. But I have to tell you, very sadly, right now, the church is riddled with scandals. Moral scandals, business scandals, and, um, and young people are turning away from the church in masses. Right now, the statistics are showing that Buddhism and the Roman Catholic Church are growing faster than evangelical Christianity, which had all of these, you know, huge, I mean, I've, I've preached at Yoido Church that, you know, has what, on Sunday morning, 80,000 people, and then you extend it to other parts of the world, 800,000. Um, and so, you know, it's a demonstration of the fact that if you just isolate one element, that emotive element, and you really don't ground it deeply in the word, and you don't get people out acting in accordance to that word, you can really run afoul in, in, in Christianity. And, um, you know, we, we've got loads of problems here in the United States. I think the biggest is we just sold out to the culture. Uh, uh, evangelical Christianity has become equivalent to Republican form of government, you know, Republican Party. I mean, all kinds of things that, where we have our problems here as well. So I don't, I don't want to pick on these. But I, I do think, I mean, I thank God for the tremendous growth that has been, that has taken place because they have really touched the heart and they've been expressions of the power of God. Mm -hmm. But we need holistic faith to build the church. Right. We're not just building the church for today. Right. We're building it for our children and our grandchildren and their children. Amen. And I think we need a greater sense of longevity about the church. Uh, I think some other cultures gain, gather this much better than we do, by the way, in America, where we're so now oriented. But when you begin to think of the fact that what we do now paves the way for my grandchildren, I have six of them, is going to pave the way for their children and their grandchildren, you begin to think very differently about this. So you're not just attuned so much to the immediate success which a lot of churches in America have become, you know, how can we get the big numbers and get them quick and get the big church building up and all the splash, okay? Um, and, you know, it's been interesting. I mean, in the last year and a half, again, in the American scene and some mega churches, huge scandals, which I'm sure you've, um, you know, you, you all are aware of and, and very sad. Uh, and so that's why it seems to me that we... Um, we rejoice wherever we see new movements of God, but don't rest on the laurels as if we got it all together. And I've had very frank discussions, by the way, with church leaders in Korea about this. So I'm not saying anything to you that we haven't talked about or they would talk about with, uh, with our students who come from Korea or some major leaders uh, in the Korean church. We have to take time, probably just for one more question. Uh, we'd like the last one. Okay. So you talked a little bit about bringing the balance back. Um, what safeguards would you put in place if the balance is already there, or would it be the same things as bringing the balance back in between head, hands, and heart? 
Well, I think if one, if the one has the balance, I would say just keep at it. But it's always, again, looking at ourselves and seeing, do we really have that in balance? Am I giving attention to my inner self? Am I really having that sense of inner quietness with God? I have to confess, I'm not very good at that side. Um, that's hard for me, okay? So I know I always have to work much harder at that element. I'm committed to it, theologically. You've heard my commitment to it tonight, but existentially, personally, that's just hard for me. Uh, and, and so I, I think that self-awareness for all of us is so important. And the other thing is we never want to become smug in the Christian life, as if we have got it together. We can become smug about our spirituality. We can become smug about our theology. We can get smug about our actions of service and mercy in the world. And uh, as soon as we do, somehow we've moved away from dependence of the grace of God to dependence upon ourselves. Amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you so much. Uh, this was a really stimulating talk. Thank and you. Uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, talking about it in our, our classes and among the students uh, in the days to come. Um, Yes, well, thank you all for attending as well. It looked like there was still some more food um, over <laughs> in, the, in the main room. Uh, so, yeah, help yourself. And, um, yeah, uh, blessings to you.